and let me share my screen, okay? And then I'll just kind of, you know, I'll kind of skim through these multiple choice. And actually, if, if as you see on my screen, me going through one, if you're like, oh, can you kind of go over that one? I, I can do that too. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of do it as a, um, in sort of edit mode, just so you know. So it may look weird, but then I can um, make changes if necessary, okay? Uh, yeah, so we're, it just works out this kind of the easiest this way because I can just search for questions that I need to go over um, based on what you guys told me. So this is the this is the one here about the pressure ulcers, I believe. Yeah. Okay. So a nurse working on the busy medical unit. Wait. Oh, by the way, my my um, internet's slow today, or Moodle slow, something slow. Incidence of pressure ulcers right in the patient population. Which action demonstrates the principles of evidence based practice? Okay. So this is trying to get at that. That's what it's asking you. So. Um, Right, the correct answer here is reviewing the literature for the current best practice for presser, pressure ulcer prevention. So sure, it's important that you're following, you know, procedures of the, you know, of the hospital correctly, but that, that doesn't have to do with evidence-based practice, right? Are we all right with that? Whoever had that question? The key is here, again, evidence-based practice. All right, let me go back. That's not what I meant to do. Sorry, I hit the wrong tab. All righty. Now, do we have anything there? No, let's put this up here. All right, there we go. I don't want to miss one. Oh, here we go. Okay, so carry typing. Okay, the nurse explains to a patient undergoing carry typing that this test will, okay, examine nucleotide changes in the gene? No, right? Um, detect small deletions or structural abnormalities of the chromosomes in the DNA. Small deletions. It's not, right? Remember, a karyotype shows you the whole chromosomes. Now, if there's a big piece missing off the chromosome, it, it might pick that up. Um, but these are, you know, large sort of chromosomal abnormalities. Okay, so again, the only thing it really can pick up, like I said, it's not going to pick up small deletions in the chromosome. It's only going to pick up even if it's a part of the chromosomes that's off, it's, it's likely not going to be able to pick that up, like I said, unless it's missing like a whole bunch of that chromosome, like almost the whole chromosome or, or most of it, right? So the, the best answer here is examine the visual appearance of the chromosome, structure, and number. I see why perhaps kind of this, because it, it says structural abnormalities, but again, it's not going to pick up small deletions. So... I guess I'm kind of sorry if this sort of threw, threw you off, but the idea is if it's a kind of small change in the structure, it's not going to pick it up. Well, who asked that? Does that, is that? does that clarify that for you? Yes, thank you. You got it. Okay, let's go back. What's our next one? Let's see. Oh, come on today. No. I'll just hit back next time. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Mondays are rough, right guys? All right, let's see, we got here. <laughs> Am I missing anything here? Is this one? Uh, no, social environment, right? The, um, I think it was the biomonitoring one. Okay. Oh, here, this one. Somebody asked about this one too. Public yeah. health first. Yeah, right. Yeah, public yeah. health first is assessing the social environment of a community. Which of the following would be included in this assessment? Now, two key things, right? Social environment and community level. Okay. 
So we got here, social environment, right? Presence of sidewalks, not social environment. Accessibility to parks, um, right? Convenience of public transportation, that's all, that's not, that's not part of the social environment. It says here, availability of health education. Which one did you choose? I chose the park one. So now that I'm, I mean, so what's your argument as to why you could, you could justify that, I guess? I was just thinking as like, since like social environment, it also connects like getting kids out there to be physical mm -hmm. and active and also the communication with friends and. I agree. Uh, yeah. So, so, okay. So that's a good argument, right? So as I'm reading this, right. I mean, it's true. You could think of it that way. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll take that answer too. Well, yay. <laughs> Because it's true. I mean, it is kind of part of the physical environment, but you could see how that totally would tie into social, right? And again, it's community level. So, um, anywho, uh, so thanks. That's why we're doing this, right? Like, you know, there's no kind of as long as it's reasonable. You Wait, know, professor. Yeah, go ahead. I had a um, question on your number on your number twenty eight. Can you go over that one? I don't know. Again, the numbers don't mean anything. You have to no, tell I, me. no, I saw on your number, like on your 28. That's on one of the questions that I had about. Yep. This one. Yeah. Okay, so now this again is going to be specifically um, talking about the transactional approach to stress. So again, you have to kind of make sure you really read these carefully, right? Um, okay, so Sure, these are all kind of true, but if you're just focusing on the transactional approach to stress, it's about the perceived meaning of it. Okay, so again, all of those things are true in terms of stress response, but when you're again focusing on transactional, it has to do with the perceived meaning of the stressful event. Okay, and then that's going to impact the response. Does that help? I mean, there's not really, there's no other yeah. answer that particularly, yeah, that particularly pertains to that transactional approach. So if it was just kind of a general stress question, then there would obviously be a whole bunch of possible answers, but because it's transactional. Um, public health nurse and social environment, and then the one about genetics counseling. But yeah, something else kind of, it's not this one, right? The genetics counseling one, what, which one was that? Anyway, I'll figure it out, let me say. Here's the genetics counseling one. Then I think, like I said, there were things, I have one more on my list. All right, when providing genetic counseling, the nurse explains that the observable clinical expression of genetic coding is called what? I mean, the answer is, is obviously is phenotype. You guys can see that there, but why? I mean, what what um, that's sort of the definition of phenotype, right? The idea is that you have the genotype, the genetic, you know, information genetic sequence, but then that is expressed as phenotype, right? And for our for your guys' purposes, you usually think about phenotype whether there's disease or not, right? I thought well, the phenotype was like physical traits. It, for again, it is physical traits, but it's also disease or not. In our case, when we're talking about pathophysiology, we talked a whole bunch about genetic disease, right? So remember, we talked about like you have the disease allele, right? The, the recessive allele versus the dominant allele. The phenotype is: are you a health, right? Healthy, or do you have the disease? In that case, okay. None of the other choices really even make. Um, you know, they, they're not going to be, they don't correspond to what the question is asking. Is that okay? You all right with that? All right. Um, all right. One more that I have on this list here is about, oh, social environment and community. Oh, it says public health nurse. Is it this one? Oh, I see it. Nope. It's right above that. Anyone have a question about this one? Because there was a couple, I actually, this is one of the questions that I actually added an extra answer for, just so you guys know. Somebody had a question about that. I took two answer. So reducing 
lead blood levels in children. And then I also took this one because um, I guess you could potentially provide an argument for kind of both of them. All right, let me um, go back to that one that somebody asked about. It's right above this one. Of course, now I probably don't remember what that was. Here, I, somebody had a question? This, this was somebody's question, yeah? Maybe. All right, public health nurses assessing the social environment of a community, which of the following would be included in this assessment? So again, social environment, community, is this the one we already did already? This is the one we did already. I think the other one, um, I saw it on your computer, is 21 on your computer. Thank you. I was going to say, we did this one already. What am I talking about? 21. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I like wrote it twice, the same one. Okay. So this is the one that actually when I read this over again, I was like, kind of like, hmm, I'm surprised nobody uh, asked me about this. Um, now, again, the best answer is definitely the one that's listed as 100% here, right, at the end of the work shift. Um, though, you know, some of these don't make sense, right? Obviously, if you're talking about occupational exposure during the work day, you're not going to take a sample during the pre-employment physical, although I guess you could argue that you might want to do that too, um, because you would want a pre-assessment versus a post, right, to show that there was no exposure here, but there was after. But that's the scientist in me, I guess, talking. So what'd you put? Did you pick this one in the middle of the work shift? I actually said um, in the pre-employment, because I was thinking like sometimes when you get a new job, they want you to get a physical, like to see if you're healthy enough to work. Right. So that's but, what I was thinking. <laughs> but this is particularly asking you about biomonitoring, right? So it's biomonitoring for exposure to chemicals in the workplace. So it's not really, it's not talking about a pre-employment physical in terms of assessing your health before, right? Um, so if you, what does biomonitoring mean, I guess? What do we mean by that? That was definitely a term that was in that, I guess, whatever this, I forget what chapter this is, the chapter three or something like that. What does biomonitoring mean? It's the idea that you're taking a biological sample, right, to look for the presence of, of some sort of, you know, environmental or occupational exposure, right, that could potentially lead to disease. So you obviously would have to take those samples, right, after the work shift or maybe during. So the, what I was going to do is I, I'm probably going to code this as, as also a right answer because potentially as long as we understood that we want to take it during the work shift. Because, I mean, depending on what what it is, it may not stay around very long, right? So you would wanna get that sample kind of right during that work shift or shift or right after. Does that help? I have a question also when, yeah. when you're done with this one. What's, the, what's your question? I think that the point is, it's not just about doing a health assessment as a nurse working in the in industry, right? It's not about the pre-health assessment. It's about biomonitoring, right? So if you're biomonitoring, it means you're taking samples and testing for the presence of potential, um, you know, occupational health hazards, right? So in order to do that, you would have to take that sample during the work shift or after the work shift. You guys have more questions about that? Uh, okay. Professor, I have a question. So you said that it's also understandable if you, if they take the sample during the work shift yeah. as well? Yeah, both answers, yeah. Okay, I, I, I got that, but I got it wrong. So that's why I was a little bit confused on yeah. that. <laughs> I didn't change it yet, right? I'm just changing it right now. So it's not gonna, oh. once I go back, then I have to hit recalculate. You'll see that it'll come back to you, okay? Understandable, thank you. Yep. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to go over the essays quickly. Like I said, I don't want to spend too much time on this. So, go ahead. Uh, can we go over the one about uh, the nurse teaching the prenatal class about uh, to prospective parents? How does it start off? 
Uh, the nurse is teaching a prenatal class to prospective parents, which root of exposure does nurse teach is involved to developmental of fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, so which route of exposure does the nurse teach is involved in the development of fetal alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome without even looking at the choices? What's the answer? The answer was transplantal, but put it in in ingestion because like what we digest goes basically to the fetus because it's via transplacental right if you're talking mm -hmm. about ingestion that's just you affecting your body but it's ingested and then it, it gets transferred to the fetus that's transplacental mm -hmm. yeah yeah there's definitely only one answer for that one i have a question on a, a question also okay on on what on, on the question that says the nurse in the student health center is counseling a college student who reports high levels of stress before each exam, mm -hmm. causing his heart to race and affecting his ability to concentrate. All right, just a couple more after this, guys. Like I said, I don't want to spend the whole class period on this because we got to move on, but go ahead. Uh, all right, let's look at this one. The nurse assesses that this student is in which stage of the general adaptation syndrome during the exam. So remember, we talked specifically about that, right? There were sort of these three stages that we talked about, okay? So reports high levels of stress before each exam, causing his heart rate to race and affecting his ability to concentrate. So it's, a, it's particularly asking about that, okay? When his heart's racing and it's affecting his ability to concentrate. So it's stage of alarm, right? Stage of alarm is when you have that increase in sympathetic activity. That would, that's what would cause your heart to race, right? Make sense? Yeah, I, I put stage of exhaustion because I thought that was the inability to concentrate was a part of the, the stage of exhaustion. Does, he, does, does it say anything about inability to, well, all right, here, but that's not, that's, stage of exhaustion is when you're at the breaking point, right, where your body can no longer really cope with the stress. It's, it's not after a single event, it's usually after repeated, right, and so it's the idea that, so it's, it's I mean, that difficulty in concentrating would be something that's like one little tiny little symptom of that. Um, but difficulty concentrating is also a, a, a symptom of, you know, when you have this increase in sympathetic, sympathetic activity, right? And this increased anxiety, it's going to be harder to concentrate. So yeah, it's, it's, the, the, it's, again, it's referring to this stage of alarm. The difficulty and ability to concentrate is not really something that's characteristic of that stage of exhaustion. Um, that's like, that's like a really serious kind of beyond, like I said, beyond kind of just a, your heart rate raises before an exam. Um, in that case, that patient wouldn't even be able to take the exam, if that helps. Okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, let me just go over uh, just a couple points about the essays, but again, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but there was a couple, um, and, and I, I kind of am being pretty lenient in the answers. At first I was with my first class a little more strict and I had to kind of go back and, and modify a little bit. Um, that's usually how it kind of happens because I have to grade them one at a time. But once I see everyone's, then I sort of go back and kind of uh, modify. So for this one, guys, I mean, if you look at what the answer, you know, what I wrote in as the answer, it's the idea that we need to explain kind of how each one of these contribute, right? So you got to say something about each one of them and how that's going to then affect. So particularly for these two, Right, the arrows go into perfusion. So you wanna say how inflammation and metabolism can affect perfusion. And I went through this in the recorded lecture. I specifically um, explained this one diagram. So that's why I put this one on the exam. Um, and so how, what are the ways that this can happen is that again, you know, inflammation of your blood vessels, right? Causes them to constrict, right? Which will then decrease blood flow, right? Or affect perfusion, right? And I also give the example that, um, you know, diseases that affect metabolism, like diabetes, actually can cause the blood to be thicker, okay? So that's kind of the connection of metabolism and inflammation and how that then can affect perfusion, okay? 
Um, and then if you're talking about less perfusion, right, or a, um, I guess, uh, I don't know, compromised perfusion or blood's not flowing as well as it should be, that's gonna, that could then potentially, right, lead to problems with oxygenation, right? Okay, and so, and then potentially again, if you have a, a blood vessel that's completely constricted um, or blocked, it can lead to a heart attack. Okay, so any questions about that, guys? If you have individual questions, like I said, about what you wrote or whatever after I grade it, then just shoot me an email and let me know. But otherwise, you know, if you were missing kind of, you know, one of these components, then I took off some points, okay? Essentially, this part B was worth two points. The rest of it was worth seven. So like I said, if you're missing a couple or one thing from part A, I took off, you know, a point or two, okay? Any questions about that, guys? All right. Um, in terms of this question here, again, I'm not going to, I don't need to like read, I guess, repeat what I, what I wrote, but for here, in terms of part A, I was really looking for you to give me a definition of what a SNP is, okay? I mean, that's, that's pretty much it, um, something along those lines, okay? And most people did that. And in terms of B, okay, I, I kind of, there's a couple different answers I might have taken there, you know, but I think the idea is that a SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism that's um, identified isn't necessarily some definitive clinical test, right? So the idea is to kind of convey that to the patient that with sort of caution in terms of getting a genetic test for that. Does anyone have a question about this? Okay. All right, um, next one, and we just have one more after that, so. All right, so this is kind of long. Um, I really, for part A, was just looking for you to pull out the occupational exposures that he had from the text that was written, right? This was pretty straightforward and pretty much, you know, with them. Okay, so noise exposures I have here, his time in the military, his time working at the printing company, he's also exposed to solvents like toluene, okay? Um, so, you know, some people were more detailed than that, but that was enough detail there. And then in terms of most likely cause, I mean, I kind of have written here, you know, the most likely cause was his 40 year exposure, right, at that printing company. Um, I also have written in here military exposure. So if you sort of added in a couple of the other exposures along with, the, you know, the printing press um, exposure, then that was fine. But it's the idea of understanding that this chronic long-term exposure is really what probably ultimately um, contributed most to his hearing loss. Okay, the other factors as well, but it's that idea. Any questions about that, guys? All right, last one. All right, so for this one, I just nixed totally what I expected. Um, everyone kind of, it, it was the way it was written. I'm not, I, I didn't mean to say everyone missed it in um, my other class too. I, for the first one, I was trying to get you guys to like say that there was an increase in sympathetic activity or HPA axis, axis activity that then led to the, the um, problems with the immune system, right? Potentially causing more inflammation or suppressing the immune system, but it doesn't, the question didn't really say that. So as long as, you know, you kind of um, said something about, you know, the stress sort of changing immune function, some people just kind of said reduced immune function. So something along those lines, but the idea that there was the connection between stress and the immune system, which was likely making her asthma worse, okay? Um, so, so as long as you kind of had, you had something like that, then that's what I was looking for. Um, and then for part B, most people got this. It was the idea of coming up with different ways to cope with their stress, right? Going for a walk, exercising, meditation, all of those kind of things. Any questions about that, guys? Okay. So like I said, as soon as we get finished, I will go and finish grading those um, last couple that I haven't graded, and you'll be able to see that final grade. Um, 
also that question that I kind of changed it so it accepts two answers, I have to go back and kind of hit regrade and you'll see those points come back, okay? Just so you guys know. Any other questions related to this, guys? No? Okay. So a couple things, I, I didn't do it yet. I'm gonna change the due date for chapter eight case study and for the exam two review sheet, okay? To Monday, so a week from today. I think we need a little more time probably with, I mean, chapter eight, I didn't even upload that recorded lecture yet. And if you guys look at the review sheet, um, I'm sure probably you're aware that there's, there's a decent amount of stuff in that, in that chapter. So I wanna make sure we have enough time with that chapter before I give you the exam, okay? So, um, Reminder again that you should be writing your notes in this review sheet or at least having that review sheet out and jotting your notes down in, in a notebook, right? When you're listening to those recorded lectures. Um, and we'll go over a little bit chapter six. I'm not gonna go over the case study today because there's a couple people who haven't handed it in. So if you want it, if you still wanna hand it in, you can have until Wednesday. I'll take off some points, but um, you, you can hand it in and we'll go over that case study um, then. Once everyone submits, I also can post the answers because I have the answers ready to post, okay? But there's some people that haven't submitted it. So I, I gave you a zero right now. If you submit, I will take off some points, but I'll, I'll accept the assignment. Um, so like I said, those two things I'll push back until Monday, okay? And then for the next exam, I will give you more time, okay? Um, either I'm gonna give you a few less multiple choice, or I'll give you a little bit more time, just so you guys know, okay? Because I feel like, you know, again, I have to keep the time, you know, constricted to, to sort of account for having notes and things like that. But I also wanna make sure you guys have enough time to read through the essays and do them properly, okay? So uh, I will give you guys more time on that. I may also, just so you know, just say, hey guys, you have from like 9 a.m. on Wednesday to 5 p.m. to go in and complete the exam on your own rather than having everyone log on and do it that way, okay? Um, the only issue is, is that I'm not really available, you know, at, the, at a drop of a dime to answer a question, okay? Um, so that's the disadvantage to that. Um, but, but anyway, I mean, what do you guys think about that? Doing the exam that way. What I may do is just say, hey guys, I'll be on Zoom, on the class Zoom from, during our class time. So if you're completing the exam during that class time, you could always pop in and ask a question there. So then that way you know I'm there. Um, regardless, either way, I will give you guys more time with the exam, a little bit more time, okay? Anyone have any questions or anything about that? No? Okay. Um, all right, so if you guys take a look here, this is the exam two review sheet. So remember, exam two is gonna be chapter five. Oh, and we'll also go over the chapter five, six quiz in a second, okay? Um, chapter five, right? Chapter six, which is what I just put up that recorded lecture. Hopefully everyone had a chance to listen to it. Um, and it's kind of short in terms of what I listed here because I went through sort of the same things for each of those substance use disorders, right? So you want to fill in the details for each one of those. Um, and then we are covering chapter eight. So again, if you take a look at chapter eight, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff there and there. It's kind of, you know, it's things that we haven't talked about yet. Okay, so some different, really different types of concepts. And so we will need to spend enough time, or, you know, a decent amount of time on this. So I don't want you guys to feel like we didn't cover it enough before the exam. So like I said, it'll be Wednesday. Um, all right, so let's go over the chapter five, six quiz. Um, and then I can elaborate on a couple of the questions there. And then I have the chapter six lecture ready to go. So again, I can pull up um, a couple of things and, and go over some of those concepts as well, okay? Um, is there anything right now that anyone wants to go over for chapter six? Just kind of, you know, that you remember from the quiz or, or just from the recorded lecture or from your notes or anything? Nothing that sticks out? Okay. Um, all right. One second, let me just make sure that everyone completed this. I'm just stopping my share for a second. And yes, okay, cool. Uh, 
All right, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so yeah, everyone did the quiz, so let's go over the quiz. I will do it as a preview. It's a little more easy that way. It's going. So do we like doing the quiz this way rather than doing it at the beginning of class? Maybe. All right, what do you got here? Number one, guys. What's the answer? Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. Yeah, hypothalamus, good. Um, right, so we talked about hypothalamus in our stress chapter and we talked about it a lot in that obesity chapter, right? All right, cool. Um, all right, this. This question here, blank is defined as the inability of insulin to achieve its expected biological response. Insulin resistance. Insulin resistance. Good, insulin resistance. Okay, so I, I, I kind of asked this question to my other class too. I mean, why do we call, so it says the inability of insulin to achieve its expected biological, biological response. So why, what's actually happening, I guess, if we think about in, in the lecture, remember I added in that picture, I know I pulled from, from the internet that, that showed you a cell, right? It was like a cartoon of a cell, okay? And kind of showed you what normally happens with insulin. So when we say insulin resistance, what's actually going on? What specifically is happening there? So yeah, it doesn't achieve its biological response, but why? Was it because like it wasn't binding? Like I don't remember it specifically, yeah. but I remember like seeing something like binding or something like it wasn't like taking it and moving it throughout the blood yeah. or something like that. Good. Yeah, you're on the right track. So, so I guess the the my next question would be. So we'll continue on what you just started. But insulin resistance is it is it because there's not enough insulin being produced? Right. The answer is. The answer is no, there's plenty of insulin around, but right, the problem is it can't bind to its receptor, right? For whatever reason, there's, those receptors are destroyed, they're downregulated, there's not as many receptors around, right? And if insulin can't bind to its receptor, it can't bring glucose into the cell, right? And then the cell doesn't have glucose to use as an energy source. That makes sense? So I just wanted you guys to kind of think about, well, sure, insulin resistance means this, but what actually does it mean, right? What actually is really happening, you know, physiologically speaking? Does anyone have other questions about that? Could it cause like overproduction of insulin perhaps because your cells are trying to get yes. it? Okay. Yeah, it, you're right. So if correct, so what does happen is because there's still a lot of glucose in the, in the blood, right? Your body does start to produce more insulin because it's trying to get that glucose out of the blood into the cell. But unfortunately, that insulin isn't able to bind to its receptor and pull that glucose in. But yes, one of those sort of responses of your body is to actually produce more. Yeah. Yep. Other questions, guys? All right, so let's move to the next one. Okay, reactive oxygen species can damage DNA. So what's this, true or false? Okay, so... What are reactive oxygen species, and why did why why am I even asking you this question? I guess when did I talk when did I talk about these? What were they related to? You guys remember? So we were talking about in re in relationship to obesity, right? That um, we see an increase in these levels. There's a couple of other kind of concepts and things, I guess, that surround this, right? The idea that your cells, you know, produce reactive oxygen species is kind of a normal thing that happens just from metabolic reactions. I mean, there's certain other things that might induce the production of them more, but, but for the most part, they're there. And your cells have enzymes that can get rid of these, right? And then what's something else like in the diet that you can eat that supposedly will remove these reactive oxygen species? I mean, certain, I mean, certain vitamins kind of and, and nutrients are, are sort of help the enzymes work properly, but also like antioxidants, right? Those are things that can reduce the, the numbers of these. Now you'll see, I think we, we mentioned reactive oxygen species even like in chapter one, and now it came back again. 
that we will talk about it again through the semester. So just understand that these are things that are normally in the cell, but not to such a high level. So when the levels get so high, it can start damaging, you know, molecules in the cell like DNA, okay, and other molecules as well. All right, um, fat cells, what are they called? Adipocytes. Adipocytes. What hormone that we talked about is produced by adipocytes? Is it lipoprotein? Oh, leptin. Leptin. Yeah, remember, I think a, a kind of a couple of people had, you know, we had questions, I think, about that leptin, and we went, we went over that, right? All right, good. Um, all right, addictive substances, they increase what in the nucleus accumbens? I think I mentioned this a couple times. Dopamine. Dopamine, good. So remember, um, you know, there were a couple, dopamine being one of them, probably the biggest one in terms of a neurotransmitter that kind of kept coming up, right, in chapter six. Um, because again, any, all of what we talked about, all of those substances, right, are addictive. Okay, so anything that's potentially addictive is going to increase dopamine, right, in that reward system and sort of the end, of, that kind of end of that was nucleus accumbens, okay? So um, wherever you're going to see an increase in dopamine in that brain area, it indicates that that substance has addictive properties, okay? All right. All right, so now what brain region below you know, that's listed here is part of the reward pathway that I talked about. Corpus callosum. Part of the reward pathway. Is it VTA? VTA, yeah. So let me just quickly kind of pull this up. So remember, um, so corpus callosum is really, it's just a white matter tract that connects the left and right halves of the brain. And so that's just a whole bunch of axons that send information from one half of the brain to the other. Um, in terms of, where's my, yeah, it's here, sorry. Let me pull up that one figure here, right? This is kind of the figure that this is sort of referring to. Remember I talked about the VTA, right, as being part of this, this pathway here, right? So if you're looking here, here's the VTA right, ventral tegmental area, and this purple arrow is going to the nucleus accumbens. So I said that this kind of starts this reward pathway, so meaning the dopamine's produced here, and then it's sent into the nucleus accumbens. So you see that dopamine gets increased there. Remember how I drew on the board the one neuron releasing its neurotransmitter into the space, right, and then it going to the other one. Well, that's what's happening here. Here's your, here's the neuron's the cell bodies are here and the axons extend into here and they release the dopamine there, okay? So the VTA is kind of the start of, of this reward pathway, particularly this, so this is, these are th kind of three different pathways that it's showing you here. I talked mostly about this, VTA to nucleus accumbens, this kind of short pathway that's shown here, okay? Mesolimbic pathway. Questions about that, guys? Mason, please lower whatever you have on in there. All right, guys, what'd you put for this one? Alcohol. Alcohol, yes, true, okay? So it enhances the effects of GABA, which is inhibitory, and it decreases the effects of glutamate, which is excitatory, right? So it has an um, overall sort of depressive effect, right? All right, which substance listed below increases dopamine and norepinephrine and is considered a stimulant, right? So which one is considered a stimulant here? Phenamine. Phenamine, good. All right, so I wasn't trying to trick you with this one. Um, so it says naltrexone is an opioid antagonist that rapidly reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. True or false? False. False. Why? What's the correct answer there? What is it? It's not naltrexone. What is it? You remember? Anyone remember? Naloxone. Yeah, naloxone. Good. Or Narcan, right, is the sort of the, the trade name for it. Um, and so what do we mean 
by something being an antagonist? Or how does naloxone work to reverse the effects of an opioid overdose? How would you describe that? Doesn't it send like epinephrine or like it, like it activates your um your sympathetic nervous system to like um like I don't know like to send adrenaline to, through you just to like wake everything up like I'm not sure but no no think about it if we're saying it's an opioid antagonist so it's going to be specifically interacting with the opioid system right so um so yeah it's not gonna you're thinking of um. I don't know if you're trying to think, you're kind of like thinking about like an EpiPen or something like that maybe. Um, but this is specifically something that's going to bind to the opioid receptors, right? Just like heroin would. But what does it do when it binds to those receptors? Does it mean block like other opioids from like, no, no. meaning or something? Yeah, it basically binds to the same receptors, but when it binds, it doesn't induce that response inside the cell, right? So it just stays there to block those receptors so that the heroin, right, or the morphine can't bind then to its receptor. So it acts as a blocker. So whenever you see that term antagonist, that's what it means. It means, you know, it's a drug or a molecule that binds to the receptor, but instead of activating that cell or, in, or kind of trying to initiate the response, it just blocks it and it does nothing, it just kind of sits there, okay? Any more, any other questions about that, guys? But how would that, like, reverse the effects, like, in, like, because I know, like, I see in TV shows all the time, like, they would, like, just, like, stick the Narcan in and they just, like, wake up. But it just, like, but even if they're over already overdosed, like, I, I just don't, I don't know if I'm stopping it. Basically, anything, so, uh, I'm not going to get into, like, some crazy, well, you guys have, didn't you guys have pharmacology? Did you talk about this in pharmacology? Next, you know? we have it next semester. Oh, we have a next semester. Okay, so there's kind of different levels in terms of when you talk about agonists and antagonists, there's like competitive and non-competitive. So think about this. If say heroin was binding to its receptor and that's causing all of this suppression, right? Depressed respiratory rate, depressed heart rate. I mean, that's essentially how you're gonna die from an opioid overdose, right? But then once you're given the Narcan, it will come in and basically knock that heroin off of its receptor and bind. So heroin, only has an action on the body if it's binding to its receptor. So if it can't bind to its receptor, right, it will basically, it will, it'll essentially stop all of those inhibitory type of effects that it has. Does that help? How fast they come back, I'm not actually sure, um, but I think it is pretty quick. So it basically just stops what, what, again, whatever action heroin or any other opiate was having, it basically stops that because again, it's going to bind to those same receptors and knock all of those other, um, all the heroin off of the receptor. And if it's not binding to its receptor, it can't do anything. It doesn't have a biological action. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it made sense. Thank you. Okay, last one. All right, after repeated use of a drug, more of the drug is needed to achieve the desired effect. What is this called? Tolerance. Tolerance. Tolerance, good. Um, and I talked about probably tolerance with, with all of those substances, right, in chapter six. Um, you know, I think it, it is something that usually um, is true for probably pretty much most substances that you use. Now, some more than others, right? So things like opioids, huge problem with tolerance, right? And that's why it's easy to overdose because you keep trying to take more to achieve that same effect, okay? Um, ho hold on one second. Sorry. Um, so what about, um, psychologic dependence versus physical dependence? How would you distinguish between the two of those guys? I mean, physical dependence, you would go through physical withdrawals, such as like nausea and vomiting and stuff like that. And psychological is more of like, um, um, I guess to, I don't want to say fix, but like change your mood and you depend on it to feel a certain way. 
All right, but what does it mean to be physically dependent on a substance versus just being psychologically dependent? I think you're right in terms of what you said about the withdrawal stuff, but what does that mean to actually be physically dependent? Would it mean like you need to, you need it to like function like physically, like almost like an like arthritis medication, something like that? Yeah, or I mean, yeah, I think it's the idea of kind of like going from like psychological dependence, me meaning like you think or you feel like you need it to you can't go to work unless you have it, right? It's going to interfere with the functional part of your, of your life, I think, right? That's kind of the, the difference between the two. I think there's a fine line between those, those two, but yeah. Um, all right. So let's make sure we did okay. And then we can sort of move on. All right, guys, so we got them all right, so that's good. Um, all right, so I guess the next thing that I just wanted to do again, you know, what, what, what do you guys want me to go over more in terms of, you know, chapter six here? So I kind of started going over this, so I think we should be, you know, we should be familiar, okay, with really specifically this mesolimbic pathway, okay? So we're talking about just BTA, to the nucleus accumbens, and what neurotransmitter is involved in all of these pathways? Dopamine. Dopamine, thank you, okay? And again, we're, t we're talking about reward pathways. So the reason why we mentioned, or I, I talked about this first before I talked about all these substances separately was that, again, anything that's addictive is going to activate these reward pathways, okay? Because again, that's where you're gonna get those feelings of, you know, pleasure and sort of euphoria is because you're activating these reward pathways, right? And this is reinforcing the, the fact or, or each time you take it when you have that same feeling, right? That reinforces that, that drug um, taking, I guess, that's, that's the wrong word, but right? But this is, it's because of this. If this wasn't being activated, you wouldn't go back and take that drug again, if that makes sense, okay? So that's why we say you sort of have to activate, you know, one of these pathways, or particularly this mesolimbic pathway, in order for something to be addictive, okay? If this isn't going to be activated, it's not going to be addictive because you wouldn't want to go back to it again, okay? Um, questions about this, guys? Could you talk more about um, GABA? Because I was looking over it and, like, I kept getting confused and I don't know if I just wasn't understanding it. Okay. But, yeah. Um, all right, so what do you mean? Just kind of like in general, what its role is, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, GABA is basically just a neurotransmitter um, that always is inhibitory. Meaning if, if again, if you're gonna, hmm, let me see if I'm gonna draw, draw that. So any, anytime GABA, so let's think of it this way. So anytime, so GABA, again, it's a neurotransmitter, right? It'll be released into that space, right? Say between two neurons. And then what does it do? It's gonna go and bind to its receptor, right? So anytime GABA will bind to its receptor on that sort of that target cell, what it will do is it will suppress the activity of that target cell, right? So that's why we say it's kind of inhibitory, meaning it kind of will always sort of slow down activity in the central nervous system. Does that make sense? So if you're gonna activate GABA or do something that's gonna make um, levels of GABA go up, that essentially will kind of lead to inhibition and sort of general sort of depression um, or suppression of sort of brain activity, I guess. Does that help? Yeah, would you, like, would certain um, substances that you talked about, would they inhibit that? So, like, if you, um, if you drink alcohol, it would affect your, like, um, it would affect, like, visual, like, it would visually impair you or something like that? Well, alcohol does what? I mean, it, it mostly kind of, it does things to sort of increase the activity of GABA, right? And decrease glutamate because it's all overall suppression. So I guess I wouldn't think of it as being, I guess, specific to a certain kind of function if you're thinking about that. I see, I see what, I guess I kind of understand it. Say, say your question again. I think I'm understanding what you're asking. Like, would, like, for instance, like, I know if you drink alcohol and it visually impairs you, sometimes or it depends on everyone but like what like would that be considered like, of it, like yeah 
So, oh, so it increases GABA. Okay, now I understand. Okay. Yeah, it increases GABA, right? Because again, it's, it's this overall sort of suppression, right? And we think of alcohol as being sort of a depressant, right? Because if it increases GABA, it kind of inhibits and slows kind of brain, brain activity down, right? Slowed responses, right? All of that, if you kind of think about that. Does that make sense? Um, all right, other questions? Let me change locations for a second. Sorry. Um, other questions, guys, or other things you want me to go over specifically here? I mean, I think I kind of talked about some of these. I'll, I'll tell you about another, one of the other questions that somebody asked in my earlier class um, was particularly about this slide. I will tell you that this is a slide that I added to. So like when I looked at my lecture from last year, I, um, I kind of was like, ooh, I need to add some details in here. So this, this was um, something that I added in here. So somebody asked a question about this before. So that's why I was just kind of wanted to pull it up. Does anyone have questions kind of about this, I guess? Any questions about this, guys? I mean, again, I, you know, I, I just, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on this because this is particularly, again, focusing on heavy use of alcohol for a really long time, right? Chronic heavy use of alcohol and how this, this can affect the liver. I'm sure we've all heard of that before, right? But I guess I wanted to make sure I kind of went through just a, you know, sort of briefly as to kind of why or how. Right, so, and, and so that's what those first two bullet points kind of, um, or really the first one kind of explains really in a short way, right? But that it can lead to um, cirrhosis, right? Where again, these liver cells will die and then they're replaced by fibrous tissue. Um, in terms of like other symptoms of cirrhosis and things like that, we're not gonna have to worry about that because if we get to that chapter later on, we'll talk about that stuff specifically, but we wanna know that heavy use of alcohol over a long period of time can li lead to liver disease, um, can lead to uh, cirrhosis and other, again, um, liver issues as well, okay? And obviously cancers and things like that. So I guess um, I, I added sort of this slide in just to elaborate a little bit more in terms of the negative effects of really prolonged use of alcohol um, over time, okay? All right, let me... Um, the other thing that somebody asked too was in terms of like, um, on the review sheet, it says, and I'm going to pretty much kind of end here if you guys don't have any more questions, but on the review sheet, it says here, examples of drugs that fit into each category, right? Um, and so what do I mean by that? I mean, obviously for alcohol, it's only alcohol, right? Um, for cannabis or whatever, it was just only THC or marijuana, right? But for like stimulants. Right? Somebody give me an example of a stimulant. Another example. We, we, we gave one already when we talked about the quiz. Um, what was an, what's another example of a stimulant? Co cocaine. Yeah, cocaine is another example of a stimulant. Right? I think on our quiz, we, it was amphetamine. Um, what else? What were some other examples that I gave you guys? Was heroin one? No, nope. what's heroin categorized as? Is it opioid? Yeah, opioid. Heroin's an opioid, right? Morphine's an opioid. Um, I think I mentioned a synthetic opioid like fentanyl when I when I did that recorded lecture. That's a nasty, nasty. Um, it's super, super potent. Um, and just a tiny bit of fentanyl is really, really dangerous and, and leads to a lot of overdoses, especially if it's mixed with other opiates. Um, what about, what did I say? Oh, another... Oh yeah, so here we go, right? Amphetamine, methamphetamine, okay? These are all examples. So if you guys have ever heard of bath salts, those are also stimulants as well, okay? So I guess let's, let's kind of understand, right? If you're kind of thinking about stimulants, stimulants and opioids, they're opposites of one another pretty much, right? Now again, they're still gonna interact with kind of similar 
neurotransmitters are all, all, with all of these, there's similar neurotransmitters involved, right? But it, it depends on kind of what brain regions are activated and, and kind of um, in terms of kind of what behavioral effects it's gonna have, I guess, or psychoactive effects. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that I know that we talked about dopamine a lot, right? Mentioned norepinephrine and kind of mentioned the same types of neurotransmitters over and over again. Um, understand though that dopamine in one brain area, right, has a different function than dopamine in another brain area. And the reason why we were always bringing up dopamine is why? Because we were talking about addictive substances, okay? Um, you know, and then there, so then, so just kind of think about the sort of differences with some of these. We just talked about alcohol, right? Where it increases GABA. Anything that's gonna increase GABA is gonna have a sedative or depressive effect, okay? If you're increasing glutamate or you're decreasing GABA, that's gonna have a more excitatory type of um, action, okay? Um, so, so anyway, these are kind of just some things to kind of think about as you guys are listening to that recorded lecture if you haven't already. Right. Um, I don't know. Other questions, guys, or other things you want me to go over a little bit more? So same thing. We should be able to give. So I'm, I don't expect you guys to know every single example, say, of these hallucinogens. Right. But if I said, you know, LSD is an example of an opioid, you know, a stimulant or a hallucinogen, we should be able to answer it that way. If I was gonna ask you to give me an example, right? I would say, hey, list two examples of hallucinogens. I don't expect you to know all of them. Does that make sense? Okay, guys, so just kind of make sure you know uh, some examples. But like I said, if I said peyote or whatever, or like I said, LSD or PCP, we should know that it's not an opiate, right? Or an opioid, it is a hallucinogen. All right. Um, so like I said, other, other questions, guys? No? Um, you know, if we don't have other questions, then, you know, I, if you haven't listened to that recorded lecture, please do. I will be putting up chapter eight recorded lecture, you know, certainly by tomorrow. And we'll focus, you know, on Wednesday. We'll go, well, on Wednesday, we'll go over that chapter six case study. And then, you know, again, if you have any other questions, I can review some other things, but then we'll start on chapter eight, okay? Your next exam will be next Wednesday. So we have a week, week and a half or whatever um, for that next exam, chapters five, six, and eight. Um, the other thing is, like for the project, right? We started working on it. You guys did your first journal article. I'll take a look at those. And then after that next exam, we'll sort of come back to that. And I'll tell you, guys, the next assignment will be to kind of make an outline of that project. So I'm just gonna kind of keep you guys on task. Um, but remember that that, essentially that's gonna be towards the end of the semester that the entire project is due, okay? So we'll sort of, again, come back to that after this next exam, all right? So we focus kind of on one thing at a time. Um, if you, you know, if you have other questions, I'll stay on. Um, but if you don't, then bye. And I will also finish grading those couple of exams that I haven't finished yet, okay? I have a quick question. Sure. On the PowerPoints, it's um, there's chapter seven PowerPoint. There's not a chapter eight. It's in the unit three, chapter eight. Oh, okay. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Yep, yep. you got it. Yeah, I'll stay on if anyone has questions. Let me know.